welcome to another episode of the Higher Level Podcast. Uh, so joining James Dillon and myself tonight, we have Harry Hardwick on the show. Obviously, Harry's wanted to chat about his upcoming fight in Cage Warriors 145 against Steve Amiable and everything else that's been going on. Harry, thanks for coming on the show, mate. Oh, I mention it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. No, I appreciate it, mate. So it's uh, yeah, it's getting rather close to, to yeah. fight night with Steve. It's uh, 4th of November, so I'm presuming the majority of the hard work's been done in training and uh, it's just a case of, I would imagine, being excited to get to the fight now. Yeah, like, um, I don't have, like, a huge weight cut that's much yeah. stress, really. Like, I, I'm, I'm relatively, like, light for the weight class. Um, so, yeah, I had last harder wrestling session tonight. Got a bit of a harder one Saturday morning. Um, but even then, that's not, like, a very high-impact one. It's just a yeah, last yeah. little blowout. Uh, yeah, he's just ready to boot some cunt in his face. How <laughs> big a thing is that? No, having that because you're obviously guys who are leading up to a fight, and then they get to that point, maybe two two weeks, maybe more out, where it's just constant thinking about the weight cut and the, the rough experience that's going to be. How how freeing is it to not have to worry about that so much? Uh, yeah, it like um like. I'm in this because I like fighting. I don't particularly yeah. I, like I, I, dieting and electrolyte manipulation aren't things I'm mega interested in. I, ha- I have to be interested in them because of fighting, but like mm-hmm. they don't fucking, you know, I don't get out of bed on the morning thinking about, oh, I can't wait to manipulate some electrolytes and learn how <laughs> to dehydrate myself more efficiently. Like it's not, <laughs> it, it's, it's an unfortunate reality of fighting. It needs to be done. Um, like I used to just not cut weight at all at featherweight before I had a strength and conditioning coach and like it did have its drawbacks um, yeah. I had two losses at featherweight where I did all the damage in the fights I did all the fin- you know come close to the finishes but I was held and sort of squeezed in bad positions because I was smaller than them yeah uh, so like it is necessary, but I just think there is a, there's definitely a point of diminishing returns with weight cutting. Yeah, I mean, it's something we've seen across the sport recently. We've seen a lot of guys go up and have, have a lot of success. And in terms of the training, sparring in particular, um, are you at the point now where you won't spar anymore or do you have a cut-off in your sparring? Early uh, to the fight? So, like, cut-off in more, like, competitive sparring. Mm-hmm. Um, like, MMA sparring was Monday. Like, that, that yeah. was my last more, like, competitive MMA spar. Um you still sort of do like like kind of sparring ish on fight week where it's almost like you're just going through the motions a little bit. Um and you just really, really, really minimal contact just just to keep your eye in a little bit. But yeah, um any hardest sparring is done now. Yeah. James, I know you 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 were interested in some sparring stuff with with Harry, so I'll, I'll let you jump in. I I was just um, I know you you both get both guys are travelling about for sparring quite a lot. Like you, you've been uh, I've seen you. Uh, I don't know if it was your your brother sparring with Jordan, and I know he's been next gen and stuff like that. So it, it was just um, it, it's thrown off a boxing podcast actually where a guy called Chris Dixon. He always asks the boxers about where they've sparred with, who they've sparred with and who's been like the best spar we've kind of had. Um, I know you're not supposed to talk about sparring uh, too much so I don't need like details and stuff but but we, we've obviously had a bunch of guys come up to the gym uh, further and, and lightweights to spar with the guys we've got um, so I'm just wondering like, who, who's kind of the best guys you've sparred with when you've been travelling about these different gyms. So yeah, like everyone has different things that they are really good at. Like, I wouldn't out and out say anyone is like head and shoulders above, you know, like is the, is the best I've sparred. Like, um, you know, like, like say like with Jordan and Paddy, they're, they're two very different fighters. Like Jordan has some very tricky striking stuff is, um, really good at establishing his distance. And all, you know, like, is a very different spot of Paddy, whereas Paddy, the area where I give you trouble, is just like 
he's a fucking octopus. Like, it, but I think it's important just to be out there getting these looks and sort of like being exposed to that. Um, and uh, you know, because me and George are the only two pros in our gym at the minute. Like, we've got a lot of good amateurs, but we're we're a pretty small, tight knit team. Um, so it's like very important for us not just to be seeing each other's stuff all the time. And like, even though me and George could be in a bit of an arms race with each other um, from time to time, it's still good to just not be fucking being the sole cause of each other's brain damage. <laughs> we, uh, we actually have a rule in our gym where we, we try not to let brothers spar with each other just because he, over the, what, the, the past maybe 10 to 15 years, we've had a bunch of brothers training in the gym. Um, like Danny and, and Darren Gray and then Stevie and Craig McIntosh and then we've obviously got like a bunch of the Clancy's in the gym um, and Coonley and, and Tunde so sometimes when look, we, we don't spar hard that often but sometimes when you when you, the group's sparring and you can start to hear people throwing in shots a bit harder you can pretty much always guarantee it's the two brothers so <laughs> we, we, we actually have a when I'm in the gym anyway there's a rule but the brothers are not allowed to spar, they can roll and stuff, but they let them spar. Um, and then whenever I'm away with a fighter, you get, word gets back to me, like, the two brothers have been sparring with each other and this one's dropped this one and, and stuff like that. I, can, I actually remember uh, Craig and Stevie Mop both getting ready to fight and Stevie Mop had a tinny tuna that belonged to Craig <laughs> and uh, he fucking gave it to him on like a Sunday, do you know what I mean? It's like, with the two of them and we've had to separate them. So, do you get that with your, your brother? You start getting a bit heated and stuff. Yeah, and like, just it's just stupid as well. Like, like uh, the other week, um, we were just doing some positional spars, and it was it was open guard in MMA, and like the ten second thing had gone off, and I I tried to thread through it with Della Heaver and just accidentally kicked George in the dick, and he wasn't wearing a cup. <laughs> I, I didn't know I kicked him in the dick. But he, instead of being like, you've kicked me in the dick, threw my legs to the side and threw this big, like, fade all shot that, like, cracked me. And I sort of turned around, started fighting his hands and thought, what the fuck did you do that for? And just threw this stupid punch that kind of landed with the thumb and the unpadded bit of the glove, like, <laughs> around his eye. And we were just like, we were just a bit like, well, that was all pointless. Like, yeah. <laughs> there were so many points where that could have been stopped, that could have stopped happening. But, yeah. It is what it is. I had a fucking. I had to wear um, a head guard for every round of sparring and a fucking bandage and scrum cap combo for every round of grappling for my entire last fight camp because of a cut that happened in a spar with George at the <laughs> like the seven week mark. <laughs> uh, bro- brothers will be brothers. I could see when you were saying that, James. Uh, James I could see how you had a, I could see the bit of the wry smile in your face. Go on, I know what he's talking about there. Yeah. <laughs> the strange thing is, though, like, this is going to sound like, it is the, like, probably having a hard spa with George is probably my favourite thing to do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it, it's, it's odd. Um, like, we're not even we're, we're not mega opposed to the idea of fighting one another, even though we're fucking like <laughs> each other each other's coaches to an extent. It's fucking. Uh, I mean, uh, you got to think you've been fighting each other most of your lives anyway. Yeah, like you just get paid to do it. Give us a couple million quid, we'll have a fight. And I tell you, like, it, it, I know us animosity would sort of build up in the lead up. Like, it wouldn't be anything fucking like overly chatty it would just get really I know how me and George work it would just get really intense but it, and we would try and kill each other like start fighting with each other at the way and stuff <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah it's it's a it's strange dynamic like I, I said it before on a podcast like your siblings are like your first friends and your first rivals like that when you add fucking being professionally competitive at having fights into that mix it always you know it's always interesting but it's also that dynamic do you think that part of that that's made you the fighter you have today uh 
Probably. I feel like it, it, it's part of the scrappiness in, mm-hmm. in both of us. Um, it probably comes from that a little bit. Because to be honest, I, I, I'm, I was a pretty timid kid and I am pretty like non-confrontational and like, mm-hmm. like I don't, you know, I've, I'm, I'm not sort of about that, but there's, there's just something about fighting and I feel like it, there will be an element of just fighting George for my entire life that has like led to me having that, that, that dog in me or whatever the fuck you want to, you want to call it. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, let's, let, let's speak about, uh, Steve. So this is, this is your, this will be your fourth fight for cage. Fourth fight. Am I right? Aye? Yeah. Fourth fight. Um, obviously Steve's a name that's been about cage warriors for a while. He's pretty well known in the UK. Um, First off, what's your thoughts on Steve as an opponent, and and would you would you think he'd match up? And I'm assuming Ian Dean first called you about the fight. No, I, I asked for it. You asked for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got offered a fight in Manchester that kind of didn't make much sense, really. Like I, you know, George has a belt and I want one. Um, so I was just thinking, well, if Steve Amell is available, I want to fight him. That will make me like the the clear number one contender. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I asked for it. As far as, as a fighter, um, he's an odd one, Steve, because he's like, like, he's almost like a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of fighter. Like, he hasn't changed much. Like, he's, he started doing more straight punching. Like, he used to throw more hooks and now he's more, mm-hmm. he's more just, he'll, he'll try and hold the center and throw one twos. Um, but he's just sort of had this consistent, he's just been like trucking along with the same consistent skill set for, <coughs> for uh, forever now, essentially. Um, you know, he seems, seems tough to finish. Uh, I do, I like, I genuinely do think Mads Bunnell would have got him out of there had that fight been a five rounder, like it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's, he's a tough one. Um, I haven't got a finish in Cage Warriors yet, and I'm I'm, I'm feeling like get, getting a finish over Steve Amell will prove a point. Um, yeah. I, I, ge- I genuinely feel like I'm capable of it. Um, it's like I know I could I'm I could outpoint him easily. It's just like getting that fucking finish. Yeah, is that kind of like getting the finish? You just like almost getting that monkey off your back in the promotion. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, fortunately, George has got a fair few. Which is annoying because before Cage Warriors, I was the finisher and he was the decision guy. Uh, and then it's it's flipped in the past year or so. Um, so uh, you know, I need uh, to, to be fair. It's not even about getting monkey off the back of Cage Warriors. It's more about just fucking. If he's getting finishes, I don't want. Uh, is it well? Uh, there's that, that brotherly competitiveness coming in. Did you <laughs> mention that to you at all? The the recent switch around and who's finishing and. Um. He does, but then I just come back with I ain't fighting no Czech stripper. <laughs> <laughs> a well, fucking well, Czech guy he fought went into right said Fred and he was like talking about how handsome he is in the pre fight interview and just like James, I lost it. That guy, sorry. I know like this is just my my girlfriend works for Cage Warriors as a hand rapper. And like, I don't know if she'd be happy with me telling stories about this, but he, br- do you know when like you do the ha- hands are wrapped and you do the grab the wrist test just to test your grip? Yep. Yeah. He gripped that hard. He bruised her. <laughs> 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 like he's just, he was no. stra- like, he was just a strange guy. Him like, I'm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like James. I'd love to get you to jump in on this. Cause obviously, uh, well, so Harry fight Steve. It is really, it is the implications are a, a, a title shot for this. What, what do you, how, how do you see the fight? I think it's a good, it's stylistically it's a good match up for you. Um, it, you you kind of nailed it on the head with, with Harry. It's almost like he's in his final form. Do you know what I mean? He's he's the same fighter now as what he was even when he fought Paul McBain. Um, I um, so. Just going back to that, did like you obviously noticed that you had, like you, you mentioned about him changing, uh, punching a wee bit more straight and holding the centre and stuff like that. 
uh, you, you're obviously consciously aware of the fact that you and you can see it with you and your brother actually he's like trying to add new new wrinkles to your game every time he's come out he's like showing different stuff or different different kind of aspects of your game now, a lot of guys up in the goal like I, I kind of mentioned to you before I think in passing about body shots when we were talking about some on, on Facebook once but there's not a lot of guys that have even added body shots to their arsenal for anybody they're, they're so kind of set in their ways with, with what they're doing and stuff like that you use, use guys obviously part of your process is making sure you're adding to the game and constantly developing still hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with like I'm not going too much into it, but there there is very new stuff for this fight. Like, um, but yeah, I, uh, body shots can kind of go back to the sibling thing, though, because like we're both quite conscious of brain damage. To be fair, so if a spar escalates, that tends to be where the fucking escalate, like the yeah. the nastier ones go. Um, yeah. It's why in like fights, you know, in, in the last fight, that Italian guy. He landed a few like good body shots on me, but after this, oh, did did they? Because he was just on about how I'd hurt him with the body. He was like, oh, did any of mine get through? And I was like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm very used to them at this point. Do you do you guys spar like body shots only and stuff? We do like that. Uh, yeah, like I've I've started adding it on. Um, so like, say if we've had a big glove sparring session. As, as like a, a finisher, I, th- I think it could be quite good because you can just, you know, obviously being careful of hips and elbows and stuff, you can kind of like, you can empty the tank and you can get that like, it's almost like a good a good blast of fitness and stuff and you can really fucking like swing and dig in and grit your teeth and all that stuff, which you, you just shouldn't be doing to uh, your own friends, your friends' heads. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just finishing up a wee bit there, you did, you did mention your brother, obviously, I think it was just yesterday we found found out um, he used to change your opponent coming up and it's obviously Chris Bungard that he's been put in. When did, uh, I think I spoke to Chris and he said, yeah, I think you found out about five days ago or something like that. When did you get notified? Is, is this like the, this will be the third opponent, is that right? Pardon? This will be the... Is this going to be the third opponent? Because George's opponent switched a few times. Not George didn't have a fight booked at all. Um, That's what he had one. No, no. He, um, so essentially, he was like, he was at a point where he's like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling faster and my weight's coming down. I almost feel like I'm going to be peaking out of camp. This does, the, you know, it's, it'd be a waste not to get a fight. And was a bit like, hmm. And then, um, so we'd done strength and conditioning and my car had broke down. So we, we, had, we had to just go to the cafe afterwards. And, you know, and George was like, on the little walk to the cafe, it was like, I need to set up a Patreon and I need to get an opponent. And then within like five minutes of sitting in the cafe, he had his Patreon set up and then he got a text off Ian Dean. How are you? And then I'm good. Do you want to fight Chris Bungard? And he was like, yeah, that's good. So it's just, it's like... I don't, maybe I get my wires crossed to actually Chris who had the fight schedule with Gavin yeah, Hughes. Yeah, he was meant to be but... fighting um, Gavin Hughes in Manchester. All uh, right, so I wonder if it's maybe Gavin that's fell out and they've just... Yeah, it's it's the thing with fighting. It is just like, like you know, everyone's got their you you want everything to be under sort of like ideal circumstances and stuff. Yeah, there never will be fights. Can just happen because stuff falls about in weird places. You just gotta you just gotta sort of roll with it a bit. Like, um, I've it was like George found out on the Friday, and then the next day I was scheduled to do like. It's sort of like later camp stuff where it would be like alternate between fucking bad positions and pads and stuff. I'm like, oh, George, you have to jump from not having a fight book to doing a five round one of these. <laughs> it's kind of weird how things work out. Your, your brother's talking about, I think I'd quite like to get a fight and then boom. Yeah, yeah. The it's, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, I could. He's downstairs. I could just I could take the computer down and you could ask him if you want. <laughs> we'll, just go sh- we'll speak to we'll speak to George at a, a later date. We'll get my job on. Keep up with you now. Um, how, how do you see the just go, going back to your fight? Didn't the number one contender thing? How do you see the the Vichenik Hughes fight going? And is there anyone they they two you'd prefer to fight? Um, I think. I think with Chenick, um Hughes, he, uh, he hasn't fought in a in a while. Uh, I think that's 
that'll probably be out of his favour a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, I'm one of the people who, I every time I've watched it, have scored the first fight to Vichenik. Um Like, I, I just think... Although saying that, Hughes did go from... He, he used to be just um, like a needlessly aggressive swarmer. And then in the Hendon fight, he sort of sat back a bit and he... he I, st- I still think Vichenik, um, but like, I I kind of don't really like want to call out either of them because I just I feel like whoever wins that's not sticking around. This yeah. Yeah, like, you know, they both got the blue ticks, which is more important than it should be. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's like a big marquee event for Cage Warriors, unless it's a split deci- unless it's a Vucenic split decision. I don't see the winner sticking around. If, if anyone wins this fight decisively, I think the UFC will snap them up. Um, and I'm I'm kind of hopeful of that because in an ideal world, I wouldn't mind rematching the Italian Gadja for for the belt, like. Yeah. Ob- for obvious reasons, I would like five rounds against him. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just just have to see. Like, again, just how um, we're on about with George's fight with Bungard going, like, you can't make plans in MMA, really. It's fucking... It's, it's weird, because you've got, you've got the sport element of it, but you've also got the entertainment business element of it, and you've got this, like, the scheduling, and sh- it's just... It's met, like the amount of times where you've I've just planned stuff and planned stuff and it's just not come off that way and it's just like how it did end up happening was mint anyway. Like, I, there's no logic to it. I, I do that sometimes when I when my guys are fighting, I try and almost play like matchmaker. I'm like, I wonder who we're going to get next. I wonder who will be is next. And whenever they, you, you can never pick it whether it's Ian Dean's job or or Sean Shelby's job, or, or Ray Seif was at, at PFL with Stevie, I'm like, look, we, we lost to Martinez, and then I was like, I wonder who we get next, and I'm like, I wonder if they'll give us Miles Price or something next, then I'm like, I've got Anthony Pettis next, and I was like, <laughs> he was fucking the last guy I was going to pick. Um, it's, there's no logic to it. It's, and, and making plans, like you say, is a, is a pain in the arse, is that mad saying? It's like, man plans and God laughs, it's like that, MMA's like that. It's like, I'll teach you for making plans. Um, just the way things work out, like you're saying about uh, Stevie getting Pettis here, you thought it was the last person to get. Turns out it was a, a great, great person to get because it's, I mean, two wins against Pettis is massive. And getting a chance to fight for a million quid's not too bad either. Yeah, well, like that, that's just the thing. UK MMA generally at the minute, um, we've got a British UFC champ and then yep. potentially two PFL tournament winners with. Um, with Brendan and Stevie, like I know Brendan does his camps out and about, but Leon trains just in the UK. Yeah, Stevie just trains in Scotland. Like it is a good time for UK MMA. Like right. it, it def- definitely is. I mean, right now is the best. It's just, and there's so much talent as well, guys. Even guys that are no, but obviously you've got Paddy Pimblett blowing up, but then you've got like Jack Shore out there as well. Uh, uh, it's just it's it's a great time, great time for the sport over here. And, and for do you look too far into the the future, Harry? So you've got this fight with Stevie. Obviously, you know it's title implications. Do you try and do you try and not not look too far down the line? Like you're looking to see when the UFC is going to come knocking stuff like that. It's like I'll try not to, but I am um, I'm just like I'm pathologically an overthinker and an, an imaginer and a like a. Sort of, I just will think down these bullshit imaginary chain of events in my head a lot of the time anyway. Um, but it's kind of like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, I want to fucking be aimable. And then if I can get on the New Year's Eve one and get the belt on the New Year's Eve, and then I know the UFC is coming to the UK early next year and they could jump into the UFC fight. Like, that would be mint, but fuck it, next year, just I'll try and be as vague as I can with... Like I'll have a set goal, but be vague with the timing, and I think that tends to tends to work a bit better. George will almost certainly be like within the new year, really. Like I think, yeah, he, he gets a finish over um 
over Bungard, which I, I just through how Bungard striking is matched up with George's, I, I, I do see another finish, another knockout finish. Um, that'll be a Cage Warriors title and three three knockout wins in a year. Like I, George is UFC bound. It's it's up to me to fucking rise to the top of the <laughs> fucking stupid shark tank of a, of a featherweight division Cage Warriors has. So I can join him. Um, Aye, man, you uh, you and George is the division. He's around one forty five and lightweight. The yeah, featherweight, the featherweight one at Cage Warriors is is pretty oh, stacked. It's really I, strong. I I will like it. I I would say it's probably the the best division in MMA outside of the UFC. Really, yeah. Um, like PFL to be fair I need to do a bit more like watching a PFL so it's like I kind of keep track of the UK fighters who are on it but Cage Warriors featherweight division is just it is ridiculous it's it's better than a lot of UFC divisions <coughs> like anyway <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but then James you've, you've had the opportunity obviously with Steve you've been in there and I know they're looking at other guys with you so it's you, you've got a chance to get and see how PFL runs and cause I've, I mean some organisations are I've not got it as well. You go to them and you're like, ah, I'll be at Bellator. We're in murder at times with how they've done things. Um, but PFL, they seem to be doing things, doing things right. I think they, they, they just announced, they've just signed Dominic Wooden the day off a loss, yeah. actually. Um, mm-hmm. So the good thing is there's another outlet for guys to get paid, like actually decent money. Um, and then I think that with the set up at PFL through the European series, if you if you do well on that, we'll move you into the, the their global show, whatever the fuck they call it, which is the fights in America and, and stuff like that. Um, I think they're planning on like 30 events next year for what I see. Um, and they've definitely got their eye on more UK fighters because they, they were speaking to us about about uh, Dylan Took and, and Mark Ewan, obviously. Um, and just telling us to keep them busy, but it's it's like you say, the it's exciting times for UK anyway. There's there's going to be multiple different outlets for guys. But obviously, the UFC is always going to be the where everybody wants to get to and stuff. But um, it's good for these guys that there's, they can maybe go through these organisations and get to fight like Americans and and Russians and, and international level guys, and also get paid for it. Yeah, yeah. like like PFL because obviously. Just out of interest, I've, I've checked whatever, um, like, oh, you, when when a state actually releases the the salaries, not, you know, those fucking, yeah. those memes Jack Slack boots off about where they've got the yellow writing just making yeah. up whatever the fuck people get paid. <laughs> um, but yeah, PFL, like, it seems like good money, like, yeah. so, you know, and there's, like, guys jumping ship from the UFC to PFL, uh, Stevie did, fucking... Shane Burgos has just went. Yeah. Uh, Marlon Marias has, for some reason, kept fighting. <laughs> He's came back to the dead. They've <laughs> dug him up for, for Shane Burgos. He's, he's on the same card as Stevie in uh, 29 days. And I was like, oh, fuck. They're bringing him in for Shane Burgos to Mordor in New York. Oh, man. that, that It's going to be rough, but like it'll be fun. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Marias has one chance in that fight is just to fucking swing him and cold cock him. So it's like, <laughs> Mar- yeah, yeah, it's just well, fighting. Nah, well, you know, you never know. It's a strange old sport. He might, he might pull something out the bag. Uh, however unlikely it may seem, um, but yeah, it's 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 definitely an exciting time for for UK and, and globally. You know, you just look at the talent. I mean, you you, you guys see it all this time. The amount of talent that's out there now and. The talent outside the UFC, the level is absolutely incredible. Just just again, like you're saying about the featherweight division in Cage Warriors. A great time for the sport. Yeah, definitely. Um like an amateur as well. Like mm-hmm. I do feel like one thing that is stifling amateur MMA a little bit at the minute is the fact that day before weigh-ins is the standard, which means the select few who can train like pros and do pro weight cuts and stuff are a big advantage. That and it also like because weight cutting offers an you know it does offer an intrinsic advantage. 
it kind of like limits the amount of fights someone can have. You know what I mean? Like mm. if someone's, you know, weight cutting is fucking, it's damaging and it's, it's dangerous. And like, you can't really do fucking five or six big weight cuts in a year. But I think if, if amateur fights were just same day weigh-ins, like they were most of my, amateur, I think all of my amateur fights were same day weigh-ins. It was mint. You just rocked up, you fought. If your shins were fine and everything, you you could fight another couple of months later, you know, it, maybe even the next month. Like, um, I do, I do hope it switches to same day weigh-ins for amateur. Um, I think it kind of promoters it kind of helps having it day before, so I think that's why they might choose it like that. We had uh, we had a bunch of guys on the the IMAF thing, the Four Nations, um, and it was on the day, obviously, on the way down every day, and then we just had with Enzo Pereira on the Cage Warriors Academy show in Wales, and it was the same day. It made a massive difference. See the guys training, like like you were saying about cutting your sparring back, maybe. 10 days, two weeks before an actual fight, these amateur guys were, would still spar like the week before, the Friday or the Saturday. And because of no weight cutting and, and drained, they've got more energy. And, but the quality of their training right up to the fight was, was much better. Do you know what I mean? They're not sitting in a hotel fight week, fucking starving and calculating how many calories they, they can burn on a treadmill to eat dinner. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like a lot of, you know, amateurs are younger people who are in their formative years. Like, you by forcing them to like deplete themselves like this you you know a lot well i, I feel like i kind of did with with muay thai because I, I did muay thai first um and it's like i sort of d- did weight cuts for same day fights it was it was kind of stupid but it's just sort of the culture of it a bit um <clears throat> but like i feel like the the big reason me and george are a very different build is because during my formative years, you know, like 16, 17, 18, 19. Well, I think I started MMA at 18, but like during those years, I was like doing Muay Thai and doing like fucking needless amounts of running and all this stuff. Whereas during those years, you know, George Young and me, we'd started MMA by then. George was wrestling people. He was wrestling fully grown men. Um, and I feel like that sort of is like the catalyst of it. Then there was also George dislocated his elbow and got some horrendous scalp infection where his like hair fell out and then he didn't do MMA for um, about 18 months to two years and j- literally just did fucking handstands. <laughs> like, <laughs> you'll have to ask him about that. Um, but yeah, he got like one of the rarest fucking skin conditions you can get. Like the, the dermatologist who's seen him said he'd been working as a dermatologist for like 30, 40 years and he'd maybe seen like 40 cases of it, follicolitis to Calvans. So it was this like an, uh, we'll, we'll definitely expect to George and get him on before he's fight. Was that like an infection or something like that? Or Yeah, so, like, to go on, not to go on a too like, boring deal, but there was like, a fucking nuclear strain of ringworm was going around the gym at the time mm-hmm. he dislocated his elbow. And it was one of those where like, fucking, we were having like, you know, be telling multiple people, like, you can't train, you can't train, you can't train. And then he dislocates his elbow and he sat in his sweaty rash guard in a hospital for like six, seven hours in A&E. Um, then gets just like, a hor- like literally like fucking Dalmatian level of fucking spot of ringworm on his back. And then I think, I'm not sure if it was a fucking, just the immune system in his skin was giving up or it was an autoimmune response or something because he had to be treating that so much. But then like, <laughs> just this totally separate issue formed in his scalp. And then, like, he ended up, like, it looked resident evil as fuck. Like, he had fucking just, like, blotches and shit in his scalp. And then when it when that went away and his hair grew back, it grew back curly for ages. <laughs> well, we'll definitely need to speak to George for his next fight, but obviously we'll, we'll, we'll wrap, on, wrap up on that and... Oh, it's Nari Stone. It's uh, it's uh, fourth. Of, is it the fourth of November? Fourth of November. Uh, you're fighting Steve <laughs> Mabel, and that's Cage Warriors one forty five. Listen, mate. Thanks very much for coming on the show. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Ah, no worries. I enjoyed it. Yeah.